about a half an hour ago and I stopped for a break. I don't have a VRB or break screen set up yet because I'm a relatively new streamer, so I just did the lazy approach, which is stop broadcasting and start a new one. And before the break, I mentioned this tool that I had written to do some parsing of files, and it has its own little language in it. And I, I brought that up because someone said, uh, someone described how another streamer is working on writing their own language in C++. And I thought, oh yeah, I've, I've done a little bit about that. I wanted to show off that tool. So it's called Data Disintegrator. And I'm not going to go into the code for this. I'm kind of just showing it off. Maybe, maybe someday I'll stream uh, the code for it. But the tool, it's meant to be used for if you have a pure binary data file like what you see here on the right. And for example, this is the saved game for a game I'm working on called Orb. And it's just indecipherable if you open it in any kind of traditional editor, because it's basically binary. And what this tool allows me to do is describe the format of this binary file in a sort of language that allows the tool to take the file and basically delve into it and determine what each byte means. So that's what you see here in this middle pane. So for example, at the top of the file, that 9 marks that this is version 9 of the game format. And after the version, I have all the dungeons in the game and all the heroes in the game and other variables like uh, what, what state the town has and the, the gold that the party has. And one of the cool things that I designed into this is if you were to click on something like, here I have pirate, if you click on that, it brings you to where it is in the, in the data tree, so to speak. Then you, you can kind of navigate around and you can see, okay, this is the name of hero number one. And you can see oh, his class is pirate. Oh yeah, pirate is the class, name is Bob, right? And you can also see nearby here is his various attributes, constitution, dexterity level, and the values for that. And you see whenever I click on a field, it clicks, it shows the corresponding uh, range of bytes that makes up that field. So anyway, the, this is the, the main objective of the tool, is to allow you to view. Um, in the future, I might allow editing, like let's say you might want to hack in to uh, raise this guy's level. Right now it's three, I might want to change that to four. So you might either chain, double click that and change it to four, or you might click on this byte and say four. I don't have any editing in here yet. It's just viewing. But um, viewing is, is pretty good because if, let's say, my game file gets corrupted, I can try running it through my tool, and it will point out where it started to fail to parse things. The main reason I brought up this tool is I wanted to show an example of a language written in C or C++. The way I do it is a sort of an old approach where you use a tool called a parser generator and another tool called a, I think it's just called a lexer. And you describe to those tools the, the format or syntax of your language. The first part is a lexer. So I use flex for this. And it kind of looks like a, a section where you have all your options followed by a section of regular expressions. So, for example, digit is that, hex is that, alphanumeric, etc. And then you have rules. And rules are, again, a sequence of regular expressions, which you can use other regular expressions so you can make compound ones. And in the rules section, you can actually put code. So here I have for reserved words, I have, you know, emit a certain token whenever you see that string, right? And here's a rule where something matches an, uh, a letter followed by letters and numbers. Then we emit an identifier by you know, allocating memory for the, for the text in that number, I mean that, that, that identifier, copying it in and, and then returning it. So it's, it's, the lecture is mostly about taking the, uh, your input file written in your language that you invent and converting into a sequence of tokens. The, the base tokens, like digit, hex, or the reserved words, like, like these, and the more complex tokens, like identifier or integer, right? 
and, and symbols as well. And then you get more exotic ones like when you want to handle comments. And I won't go into all this. If you want to learn more about it, look up Flex, F-L-E-X. And there's probably lots of things named Flex, but you want to look for the one that's for lexical analysis. It's really old. There's an even older one, I think, called just Lex, L-E-X. So that'll get you from characters to tokens. So how do you actually do something with the tokens, like compile and that sort of thing? That's where a parser generator comes in. And this is my dot Y. I use GNU Bison, which is a parser generator, which has been there for a long, long time. And it looks kind of like a, it, the file that it, it takes is, it looks kind of like the Lexer's input, only a little bit different. So you have, again, um, options that you can set. I don't set a whole lot. Uh, where are my options set? Not here. Okay, here, here's where some of the options are set, right? And um, but you have a lot more code and a lot more structure definitions in a in a parser generator. It, the the where it really begins is in the grammar rule section. So a parser generator, what it wants you to do is describe your language in a hierarchy of syntax, where you have an outermost, which I, for me I call formats, and the innermost would be all of your the tokens your lexer generates. So the way my language is described, I'll show you an example of, of the language itself. So for example, character, right? If we wanted to see the language for character, I have it in the configuration section here. Character, it looks like this. So my language kind of looks like C, only I've designed it so that things like, well, for example, well, actually, we have to we have to go into like, for example, what is SS, right? That's a serialized string. So when you see something like S, that's like a, a an element, what I call an element or an elementary item. And S is string. Uh, UI would be unsigned integer. And the language rules say that you, you have type and then a name and then possibly uh, where to assign it. To, a, to give it another name, and then a number of bits. So this is basically saying, parse the next six bits as an unsigned integer and, and give it the name, the name value and also store a copy in this local variable called under, a lowercase value. And then back in SS, this line is saying, take eight times whatever length is and take that number of bits and interpret it as a string. So if we look at this whole construct here, SS basically says parse an SUI to, to get a value for length. Take length, multiply by eight, and take that number of bits, interpret it as a string, and store it in value, and then return that. SUI is a little bit complicated because I let integers be any length. Basically, while there are more bits, you read seven bits into as a use, unsigned integer, and you repeat this until this special bit flag, which is one bit, always, until that's false, and then you return the value. So if it was a single byte, the bit would be zero, and then you just fit the value into the next seven bits, right? I'll show you an example of this. Back into character, right? Character. Version, the character starts with a version number, right? And here, here's an example of a check. So that version number you can see right here, the character, the first byte is th three, so it's gonna end up being version three. If you were to break that into bits, the top bit is a zero for the more bit, and then the less, next seven bits is the three. So that's version. Then after version, if it's greater than or equal to two, you have a name, so that's why the next field, uh, I can't click it because this is modal, but the next field here starts with a three and then three characters. In other words, it's Bob. And that's what SS was, right? SS is a length followed by that, n that number of bytes of characters. And it, it just proceeds describing more of how to parse. Ultimately, it parses the entire file as a game in this case because the root format was game. Anyway, the 
how you describe the syntax. So in this case, we need to match the language, which was, again, looking like this. So I'll, I'll leave that up and kind of show how it maps. So whenever you see a pipe here, it's an alternative. So formats can either be completely empty. It could be um, formats again, so it's sort of like a recursive call, followed by one format. Or a special case where you have, you've parsed a bunch of formats and then you run into an illegal token. But most of the time, you're going to hit this rule. And an individual format is an identifier, an optional ID list, left brace, statements, right brace. So that matches this game, left brace, bunch of statements, right brace. Right? So I didn't have an optional ID list. I just had an identifier. And, in, and so, so the inside of the brace is the construct statements. You can see how this goes, right? Statements can either be empty, or it could be a bunch of statements that came before and then another statement, or the case where you run into an Ill illegal token. That's mostly to, to help catch errors and show where the error was in the syntax error, right? Normally, you'll hit this rule, and you'll just be sta chaining together statements. An individual statement is a statement body. A statement body can either be a, a an element or a part, or it could be a bunch of different things. Like you can have, what is this? Uh, the same as a part, but it doesn't get assigned to a name. Conditional logic. So you have if. Here's a how you, a for loop is specified. While loop. So you're basically describing the syntax of your language. What are all the different kinds of statements you can have? Now, whenever you match these rules, you insert this code to, and run this code whenever the, the parser matches the rule. So when we, when we match a part like that, it's going to, when we're running our program, match this kind of stuff, right? So the way I've designed my language is it's really just forming a data structure in the background that matches this description. And then once it's formed that data structure, it takes a data structure match, and tries to match it up with the real data. And if, if it was as simple as just a bunch of parts, it would be simple, uh, straightforward. But I have lots of condi conditional logic, right? And that's so I can make my format for my game extensible. So whenever I like want to add something to the game, I'll bump up the version number and I'll usually add it at the end. Like if the version is greater than or equal to the current version number, then there's more stuff to save in the game. And the parser uses the conditional logic to know, you know, how to parse it. So if it, for example, ran into version two of a game, it'll parse these parts out, but it'll skip all this stuff, right? So I hope that makes sense. I know I went through it really quick, but uh, the, the core thing I wanted to show is to write your own language, it's a lot easier if you get some tools that do a lot of the low-level parsing for you. And Lexer is a good one to turn a file of characters into tokens. And a parser generator is good to describe rules to line up tokens and form higher level constructs and ultimately describe your entire source code file in that syntax, right? It's sort of giving the syntax. And how you actually do stuff when your rules are matched, that's by inserting code into each of these rules. And it's probably not a very good description. If you want to learn more, just look up Parser Generator or GNU Bison. Lots of examples online. So let's let's put that let's put that away and look at where I was before I took the break. I was working on string extensions, which is part of an, a larger library called System Abstractions. String extensions part of System Abstraction. System Abstractions. Long names, hard for me to say sometimes. So system abstractions has got a lot of things in it. One of them was string extensions. We finished that, but we have a bunch more to do. I'm not going to do them all right now or even um, this week. I'll probably just hit a few and then move on to something else. But I do want to spend a little bit of time, so probably an hour and a half 
will spend trying to write tests for code that I've written years ago. In other words, it's legacy code. And you might find yourself doing this if you get a job programming, if you're in a team, and someone it's like someone's written some code years ago, but it doesn't meet the, the standards for quality, or it's broken, or you know, it needs to be uh, changed to fit some new requirements. So the general term for that is legacy code. You pull in the code, presumably it works, hopefully it works, and your job is really to make it fit into the, the, the workflow that your team has. And the workflow I've been following is test-driven development, where we write the test, we write a unit test of a very low-level piece of code that's going to test individual functions, right? We need to have those written first, and then we write the code to make the test pass. Well, this is code we're bringing in that the code already exists, but there are no tests. So to make it fit our workflow, we're going to write those missing tests, right? The tests we would have written if we had followed this workflow from the beginning. So now we have string extensions test. Let's make the next one. So I'm going to pick from this list. Actually, it's probably better to look at in VS Code. So I don't know about clipboard. Some of these are more difficult to test than others. Time, maybe? Time might be... Time is interesting because it it's going to tell you the current time, so it's always going to tell you something different. It's really hard to... Um, to predict what time he'll run it at, so maybe not that one. Um, target info, again, it's going to depend on where you run it. Subprocess, that's where we run two programs, one as a parent and one as a child. String file might be a good one. So string file class looks like a file on the outside, but internally it stores it in memory. This might be a good thing to test. The requirements of this class are essentially that it looks like a file. So a good test would be to create one, to write something to it, then set the position back to the beginning, read it back, and verify that it, it's, it, it comes back out uncorrupted. And then we can test other things, like we should be able to clone or make another instance of the file, of the string file, and it should still work. Actually, not only still work, but each one should have its own file pointer, so to speak. And there's some other methods, like we can test a string file that has an initial value versus, you know, in a string versus an initial vector of bytes value versus a, I think this has a default constructor. I guess the default would be that it's an empty string. And we can test... There's a type cast operator we can test. We can test assignment. So let's do that. This shouldn't be too hard. So in VS Code, since it's most convenient, I'll just take the last test we wrote, copy and paste it, and rename this to string file tests. And then we're going to go into that and control shift L to select all versions of that. Oh, wait a minute. I need to get the S2. Get the whole string. Control Shift L, and then start start typing string file. And this module contains the unit tests of the system instructions string file class, as opposed to the last test was just testing plain functions. All right. So let's clear away these old tests, and for now we'll just make a placeholder that does nothing. Because first I want to make sure that this new file gets built and, and runs correctly. So we're using CMake, so I'm going to go into CMake lists and add it to our list here. Source string file test.cpp. And we should be able to go back to Visual Studio now and just hit build. It'll run CMake again. It'll, it'll ask us to reload our solution. Now when we build, we will should have yeah string file tests there and if i run our unit tests uh it's it's is it there i don't see it oh well done 
Yeah, that that should have run. I'm wondering if it's if I need to do a rebuild. Let's force a build of that. Okay. Yeah, sometimes sometimes Visual Studio gets into this mode where it when a file gets added by CMake, it doesn't it gets kind of lost about what's what should be rebuilt. So I'm sometimes just closing Visual Studio and reopening it will fix the problem. Sometimes I'll have to be more severe. Okay, I'm gonna have to be more severe, so the next severity would be to go to where the files are. So I'll show that in a second. Uh, okay. So here in our build folder, we have this .vs directory. Sometimes we have to wipe that out. I think it's because Visual Studio's cache gets into an inconsistent state. Now when we reload Visual Studio, we'll have wiped out its cache so it won't remember what project we want to run by default, so I have to reset that to this. And of course it lost all, all of our editor tabs and all that. But if I make a change here, it should recognize it needs to rebuild. Okay, still isn't. Still isn't. I wonder why. What if I manually compile that? Okay, that that got it out of its funk. I don't know why it was in a funk like that. Okay, now our test is run. It's a placeholder there. If we want to just focus on that test suite, we can do d dash dash g test underscore filter equals string file star. Now we're running a filter which selects just a subset of our tests. And that's especially important if some of the tests you've written in the test suite take a long time to run and you don't need to run them at the moment. So let's see. This is probably a good point to check in early and check in often, right? I'm going to use that tool I wrote that checks all of the Git repositories in the solution to make sure that everything is either checked in or, or not. So I have some un committed files at the root. Okay, I was working on adding a license file. So I know about that. I'm not ready to check that one in. System abstractions though. So we all we did was we establish test suite or test case or a string file. Okay, now we can move on. So let's see what can we do with the string file. Probably let's open it first. It's under system abstractions, header files, string file. So we can make one and then the file interface lets us, we can write to it and then read back or, or set the position back to the front and then read from it. So let's do that. We'll call it uh, write and read back. So we'll make one string file. So let's write Let's let's make a test string. Hello world. And we'll write that test string out. So it has two overloads. It can take a pointer to just opaque data, or it can take a buffer. I believe buffer is a vector of characters. But let me check. That's defined in iFile. Yeah, vector of characters. So we might want to test both. We'll use the overload that takes a generic uh, pointer. So that would be test string dot uh, data, and then we'll write every character in it. So length. Does that return anything? It does. And what does the return value mean? We have to look it up in iFile.
Okay, it's the number of bytes actually written. So we need to assert that we expect the entire string to be written. And now we're going to want to go read it back. So first we need to set the position back to zero. And then we can assert that we get the test string back out when we read. Okay, read requires either a buffer or this vector of bytes, which might be more convenient because then it will allocate space for us, I think. But let, let's look at that. I'm actually not sure. It reads. Okay, it's going to modify it to contain it. I think that means it will resize it for us. But let me double check. Okay, if you give it zero for the number of bytes to read, it reads as many as what you already have in the buffer. Okay, so it doesn't resize the buffer. So we're going to need to set the size for it. So we'll make we'll make a buffer. I file. Is it is it in any namespace? It is. Buffer. And we'll just initialize it with the size, which would be the test string's length. So we're going to we're going to use the overload that I can just read into that buffer. The default is zero bytes, which we just saw was to read the entire buffer's worth. And then the other argument was offset, so that's offset into our buffer. So that we can just use the defaults. Okay, read doesn't return the string, so it returns the number of characters, so it's similar to this assert up here. But after we, after we reread it, we want to assert that it's the same. So if we, the buffer is a vector of characters. To convert a vector of characters into a string, I think you just say string, and you give it the beginning and ending iterators of the buffer. So let's let's make sure that this works. And to make it fail, I'm going to follow a, a viewer suggestion, which is if we have an equal, have a not equal, and then it'll guarantee to be to fail at first. And it didn't. So that's interesting. Oh, because read has side effects, so I can't do that. I can't. I can't make that both positive and negative, but I can do that one. All right, so it should be equal, not not, not equal. So now we tested, we can write to this string file or basically a memory file, and we can write to it and read it back. Let's play around with the reading from different offsets. So let's make another test. Write and read back. We're focused on read, read back with offset or with size and offset. So the beginning of this can stay the same. Only instead of reading from the beginning, we'll just read four bytes from offset. I just want to read the beginning of world, so that would be offset one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we should get back just w r l w o r l. We'll make it five, so I can say world. Okay, the length is wrong, so which is correct. We should get five back out. Right, so, uh, oh, that's right. The offset isn't the offset in the file. It's the offset in the buffer. So it's not going to be, it's going to be, f 
five nulls. Actually, let's not compare it as a string, but as a vector. So five zeros followed by the characters H, E, L, Oh, it's seven. Yeah, sorry. Five, six, seven, and then f five characters. And then we don't need it to hold world. Really, it can just be 12, right? Five plus seven. And we can just say buffer right here. All right, so we're good. So we're testing actually two things. We're reading back, again, the offset of, what is it, uh, seven? This is an offset not into the file, but into the, into the buffer. And we're only reading five characters from the beginning. Offset in buffer. Well, let's just test both at the same time. So if we wanted to just read world and not hello, we would also, we would go to the seventh character, right? And let's make it a different offset of two, or how about three? Then I can say nine or something like that. So we expect three zeros and we expect world here. And then an extra zero, because three plus five plus one is nine. So that tests both an offset in the file, an offset in the buffer, and a size of the read, which is smaller than what's in the file. So it's a, it's a small subset both in the file and in the buffer. So that's a good comprehensive test of reading with sizes and offsets. So what else do we need to test? There's a peak. Peak is supposed to be the same as read, only it does not advance the file pointer. I was just thinking we can we can have one test that's to test that read advances file pointer. And another test that peak does not advance. So same kind of test file here. Oh, we don't need to do this assert, by the way. Since that's not really the subject of the test, we can just rely on the previous test to have tested that for us. That makes the, our test code a little bit easier. Another thing we could do, since the setup is, the com is common between a lot of these tests, we could collect them together into a, a fixture. I'm wondering if I... Should do that now or not? This one doesn't really have the same beginning. Yeah, I'll just I'll save that till later. So read advances the pointer. So we'll do two reads, right? So we'll have a buffer that's uh, as long as well, we don't need it to be any particular length. How about five characters? So we'll read five characters at a time. I'll use buffer size so that we can change that later if we want to. Okay. So it's going to read five characters at a time. So the first read should be hello, and the second read should be comma space w o r l uh, w o r. Ooh, okay. So it broke. This one returned. So, oh, 
I forgot to, it's because I forgot to set the position back to zero after writing. Uh, I should put that in both tests. Okay, good. So that this test now proves that s sequential reads, or basically each read advances the file pointer. We could also reinforce that by calling a get. So get position, it returns five there and it should return 10 down here. And you know, I'm gonna copy this whole thing and the, because the difference between the read test and the peak test is that peak should not advance the pointer. So if we, here we do a peak, the difference will be that is still gonna be that comma space whirl, but the position will be five. And if we try to read again, instead of peak, we'll read that WR, WOR again, but the position will be advanced to 10. To 10. Whereas if we did not do that, back here when we read, if we read a third time, it'll be LD, and actually this is an, another thing we can do. One, two, three. If I get rid of the end of line here, that won't read the whole buffer size, it'll only read three. That's how it handles end of file. And the position will be uh, 13. That's what it should be. Oh right, it'll it it's overwriting the buffer, so it's the old buffer had O R at the end. And this also helps document that read doesn't clear that what the buffer had before. So now we're testing a lot of behavior in both read and peak. Peak doesn't advance the file pointer. Read advances the file pointer, and all all uh, both of them also only overwrite the buffer. We can reinforce that a bit here by. When we do a peak, we can only peak four characters. And this should be an O from the hello. And this should be a four, no. No, hold on, that's the wrong thing. If we, if we peak and only peak four bytes, we should get four back and that will be an O there. Right? And it will not have advanced the position at all. Right. Okay. So we've tested both read and write and peak and get position. We haven't tested get size or set size or set position or clone. We're getting there though. Let us test, let's just test get size. So at the beginning, Oh, let me name the test get size. It should be zero at the beginning, right? But when we write data into it, the size ought to change to be the test string's length. And let's do a test for get for set size. Here, when we write to the string, and I think set size doesn't return anything. No, it returns a boolean. So what does a boolean mean? Let me look it up. I think it's because it can fail for some implementations of set size. Okay, yeah, it, it, it either succeeds or fails. I believe string file always succeeds on set size. I could be wrong though, let's see. Okay, yeah, it always returns true. So we we should assert true. And we should try setting it to a smaller size and then a larger size. So if we set it to just five, then get size should return five. And when when we read it out, we should only get five characters, even if we give it a a big enough buffer.
like this. We should only get five back out when we read the buffer. And it'll just be hello. Uh, with a bunch of zeros, right? Um, just for convenience, instead of making the buffer as long as our test string, we'll just make it eight characters. So then I'll just, in it'll be th three zeros after the end. Oh, and um, hmm. that's problematic for a C string to do it that way. So I had another test where I, here we go. I had this, had a different kind of way to, we just check it as a vector. So it's hello. Oh, do I, don't I have that spelled out somewhere? Maybe not. All right, I'll spell it out. So it's H E L L O and three zeros. So that's what a vector of character of U and eight T's are initialized to. And then we'll try setting it larger again. Let's make it go beyond the original size. So that would be. Let's just count it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So it's originally 15, so we'll try setting it to 20. We should be able to see that it's 20 back. And what is what is the actual behavior? It just does resize. So my understanding is that it will zero, zero initialize the em empties. So if we make the buffer, resize that to 20, then we should get 20 back if we read. Oh, we have to uh, set the position though. Set position to zero. Read. Then we should read back hello and then nine, 10, and then 10 more. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So that's then shrinking and then expanding the, the file. Ooh. I got a crash. Let's see where it crashed. Okay, I don't need this memory window anymore. Okay, subscript out of range. Number of bytes is eight. Offset zero, that can be a decimal again. Oh, there's no check if you go past the end of the file. Hmm, there should be. What's the minimum? Hold on. Oh, that's a bug. We just uncovered a bug in legacy code. When we set size to five, the position got set to 15 somehow. How did that happen? It shouldn't have, it should have been still at zero. Interesting. Oh, because the right pointer puts it at the end. Yeah, so the bug is that the, the, the file pointer is at 15. Set size should have backed the file pointer back out. Or, alternatively, maybe the file pointer is at beyond the end of the file. And the read should have d returned zero, right? So let's 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 do let's tell it what we should expect. We should expect we don't read anything, but if we do what I forgot to do, basically, is set the position back to zero, and then read again, we should get the full, those five characters. Okay, that's cool. This is why it's worthwhile to do 
a unit test for legacy code because we actually uncovered a bug. Let's go fix the bug. So the bug is that in read, it assumes position because these are unsigned, these are size T, so they're unsigned. It's assuming that the position is less than or equal to the size, but it's not. So I need to basically put a clamp on the position. The position can no, be no more than the size of the, you know, basically the buffer. That's going to clamp it. Now our test pass. Awesome, we found a bug and fixed it. Probably there's the same bug in peak, right? Yeah. yeah. Same bug in peak. Oh, uh, hold on. Before I blindly fix it, I should probably have a test case for that, right? Make our test suite harder. So it's both when we, let's do a peak first, that way we don't have to back up. Peak should also return zero. And the test crashes. We fix it by putting in the clamp there. Now it passes. Awesome. So that was set size. What's next? Set size. We did set position. Well, we've been doing set position. Do we ever do set position not to zero? Zero, okay, seven, so we did test, we did test that. We, we just get position all the time. Clone, we don't have a test for clone. Let's do that. So for clone, what we expect is we get an independent object that's unrelated to the original. And we get it back as a shared pointer, which is interesting. So we'll call this, we'll just call it SF. We don't need the assert at the beginning. Do I have a certain the other places? No. I just had it in that one place, I guess. Right, so what I'm going to do before I clone it is I'm going to set the position back to the zero. And now I'm going to clone it. Clone equals SF clone. And the idea behind clone is it should have its own state. So if I do stuff like write to the original buffer or read from it and advance the pointer shed no effect on the clone. So we will do both. We will, in the original, we'll set the position to five. It doesn't really matter what we do. We can write, um, we can write a feels bad man, which is how many characters long? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And that should have absolutely nothing in as far as affecting the clone. So we should be able to do what we did in the original test, which was read it back and expect the, that test string back out of the clone. First we'll test, no, not first. We only need to test the clone. The other test we had established before will take care of testing the the effects of these two lines. We just need to see that the clone, well, first of all, that it didn't move the file pointer in the clone. Hi, space aliens. First time here, all right. Yeah, good question about, am I opening open sourcing this project? I do plan to open source it, but I just wanted to do a little bit of research on you know what license to pick and where to put it. Right now I have it in a Bitbucket as a private repo. So yes, hopefully soon. And I can go through the CMake files now if you want. Um, but yeah, in a, in a, I don't know, we, uh, within a week I should have it hosted on, on I'll just probably just sw switch it to public on Bitbucket. Stream elements just left. Are my stream elements still working? Oh, it's still there. That's weird. Let me let me show you uh, if you're if you're gonna hang around. Let me show you the CMake files. So I like to do that in VS Code. So let me show you from the from the inside out. 
the component, let's pick a component that's really small. We'll, we'll pick its unit test first. So I like to keep it short and sweet, but I do have a, a little bit of configurability here. Like I, I like to have a variable called this so that I can reference that everywhere here, right? I like to keep it pretty simple. I just say what version of CMake I expect. I say what the name is. I have a list of source files. I don't like using glob because there's a problem where if you added a source file, CMake um, doesn't know that it needs to update the project because uh, the glob is only run one you, when you run CMake the first time. Whereas if you have a list of source files here, then when I add a source file, I'll be changing the CMake list and then CMake will know it has to regenerate the project. So that's why I don't use globs. So I'll do that for sources and also for header files. If it's a program, you do add executable. If it's a library, it's add library. I like to set the folder property so that when it goes into Visual Studio, it's kind of grouped by you know, what are libraries, what are tests. Target include libraries is really important because that sets up the include path for anything that, well, for private, it's for the component itself, but if you had public, it's it's specifying where your API is. Target link libraries tells you what you depend on, so we're, our unit test depends on the unit under test here, and then Google test framework. And then add test hooks it into C test. So the component itself looks pretty much the same, only it's got an API. So it's public is under include. Add subdirectory pulls in the unit tests and this extra static word because you have to pick whether it's static link library or dynamic link library. But it's essentially the same thing. So it gets a little bit more complicated when you go to your top level one. There's a lot of, a lot of glue, not glue, a lot of fix up that I have to do. I can go over it if you're interested in, but the essential part is you add subdirectory for each component, at least the way I have it set up. And at the top, I like to say what version of C and C++ I'm using, uh, what languages I'm using. I like to set position independent code on because I think it defaults to off. And I don't really understand why. Position independent code should, I think, in my opinion, always be on. You need enable testing for C test to work, I think. And then this little bit is to make this friendly to be encapsulated in, into an even larger project. What this says is basically only run this junk if it if this is the top level. But if it's included in an even bigger project, all this stuff gets skipped. The reason for it is setting things like um, the C flags for everybody. It's sort of a rude thing to do to other people's projects that are outside yours. So I'm only going to set them for um, in the case where this is the root of the whole workspace. And why am I doing some of this stuff? I have this option here, combined with this down here, no, combined with all this, for um, choosing whether or not the runtime library, like the standard library, is going to be sta l statically linked, and there's a typo there, statically linked or not. The reason to statically link the runtime library is, at least from Windows, when you give your program out, they don't, the users of your program don't need to install the Visual Studio redistributables. If you, sh if you link dynamically, they would have to in install it, and that can be kind of a pain for some people. And the difference is this compiler flag. So it defaults to being dynamically linked. So if we turn on this option, which I'll do if I distribute it to people who don't want to download something else, it will swap MD for MT and then everything's good. Google test has a similar flag, so I have it force the Google test flag one way or the other. Uh, you need this set property if you want the folders thing to work. The folders thing being this stuff, the folder property. Uh, this, this stuff was really useful to add for Linux and Mac in order for, if you make a program, to be able to find its plugins if it's in the same directory. And it's a little bit different between Linux and Apple. So in Linux, the key is to make this value go into what's called the R path or the relative path. And Apple, it's a little bit different. It's at loader path. If you don't do that, then your plugins 
aren't by default discoverable, even if they're in the same directory as your program. And I think that's for security reasons. On Windows, you don't have to do this because it's by default. If you load a DLL, it'll search the same directory as your exe and it can find it there. Uh, I personally don't like the lowercase d being added to the names of libraries if you bake the debug build, so I turn that off. Uh, I don't like Microsoft being a nanny about security warnings, so I turn those off globally that way. And I, by default, enabled Google Test, but not GMock because I don't use that yet. And I'm making sure GTest appears in my libraries folder. I used to have to do a lot more to um, massage or, or fit Google Test into my CMix stuff, but Google's gotten a lot better lately with their CMix support, so a lot fewer things I have to do. And then I'm not sure why I do this setting the output directory to be the binary directory. I don't remember why. There was some reason I don't remember. I should have a comment here. It deserves one, doesn't it? Yeah, try, you're trying to teach yourself to use CMake has been a kind of a headache. That's what everyone I've talked to thinks. And actually, w at my job, I've had to do a lot of convincing for it. The benefits, I think, outweigh the, the cost. The cost, first of all, I'm sure you know, is that it's a very steep learning curve. This custom language is pretty obscure. There's a lot of uh, improvement. A lot of room for improvement in the manual for CMake. It's it's a mess, I think. But the the benefits, I try to argue, benefits far outweigh the cost. The benefits, the primary benefit is that I don't have to force anyone to use a particular version of tool. Right? Um, when you run CMake, you can pick whatever version of Visual Studio you want. You could pick Ninja or GNU Make or anything else. And I don't have to really worry too much about the differences between build systems. I let CMake do that for me. So I've done scans and GNU Make and other stuff for proprietary. And CMake, even though there's a bit of a learning curve, I, I, I totally prefer it now over these other build systems for maintaining like a flexible approach where anyone can run any kind of version of Visual Studio or new stuff they want. So yeah, if you have any questions, I know a little bit about CMake. I wouldn't consider myself an expert, but fire away if you have any questions. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll make that, I'll open that up if like you check back in a week or something, you should be able to, to clone it. Alrighty. What was that? was the last thing I did in the string test. Okay. Why was I doing that? I kind of lost track of what I was doing with this. Let's see what shape we're in. Oh, okay, get. Oh, I f this is not testing get size. This is testing something else. Oh, this is clone. All right, we're testing clone. So clone. Right, we assert that after we wrote something extra to the string file, we're asserting that it didn't affect the clone. So yeah, it should not, the its pointer should not have changed and we read it out, we should read that original string and not anything that might have been modified. Okay, I guess we were done with that. This might, might be a good time to check in because I think I've covered all of all of the um, file contract. There's some private members that we should also test. But let's check that in and say that we covered all of, oh, we, we also fixed that bug, didn't we? Oh, let's check in the test first. So uh, write tests or all of the I file contract of string file. Commit that, and this guy was a, a, leg a legitimate bug fix. Bugs in peak and read. Uh, if the file pointer is beyond the end, I'm starting to think there's probably a bug in read and write. 
if the pointer position is off the end of the file. If the file pointer is beyond the end of the file, uh, clamp, clamp it to the end of the, the file when computing the maximum number of bytes to peek or read. Oh, we are looking at peek and read, so I think it's right that I need to double check. Actually, let's write, let's write a test for that. Before you, I even inspect the code, we can test. We can make a test for that. So, they'll be right beyond end. So first we write that string, and now we're going to set the position to something way beyond. Well, not way beyond. Let's write something smaller. Yeah, let's let's write it in. Let, let's let's actually be a little bit clever, so to speak, and we'll write the first five bytes hello. Then we'll set it to beyond the com where the comma space should should be but that we didn't write, and that doesn't return anything, does it? And then we should be able to write beyond the end. How many do we need? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, when that right, uh, okay. I was gonna think. I was gonna say we could use the i file buffer overload of that, but then this isn't an i file buffer; it's a string. Anyway, so we we expect if we write beyond the end, we should get the the whole length of that string back out. But when we read it, it'll be missing the comma, right? So that looks like this. Hello. Zero, zero, I guess, because it that's kind of what we would expect. And then we should be able to set the position into the middle. And write that missing comma, and then it should come back. So that was at position 5, and that was two characters. It shouldn't change the size of the file. We don't need to reinitialize the buffer. But we do need to set the size. Oh, I need to set the size in a couple of positions, don't I? They set it there, and then right before we read. Now when we read, we should get the comma and the space. That's what we expect. I don't, actually don't know if the class does that. But if it doesn't, let's make let's make it make it so, right? Actually, it, it it actually did it the first try. So I should have a sanity check. Another viewer recommended I just take a case with no side effects or test with no side effects and invert it. And then one of the two will definitely fail, right? So it failed. So we're good. I actually didn't think that would work, but I guess it. It does extend with zeros. Let's see. Okay, yeah, so it resizes it if we go past the end. And resize will fill with zero, so that's exactly what we want. That's great. All right. Let's check that in. Oof. Oops. Okay. We didn't have to fix anything. We just add a test for writing beyond the end. Actually, it's more than beyond the end. It's right beyond and in the middle. Right beyond end and into middle. Beyond the end and in the middle. Okay. So we've covered the I file contract. So we could test assignment operator for strings. That's easy enough. And actually we can test at the same time. Oh no, I was saying these two at the same time, but really 
we should test them independently based on other tests. So let's pick let's pick a basic test here. So there's several ways we could give it the string in the constructor. We could give it a vector in the constructor, and we could assign it as a string or a vector. So this will be construct from string. And we simply take that string and pass it to the constructor. And we should be able to read it back out. Right? And we all have a, a variation of it as a vector in there. I already have it right here. It's exactly what I want. This is test vector. Test vector. And it's really size for vectors. And here we can just compare the test vector with the buffer. Right? And now let's test assignment. Assignment should work the same way. There we don't give it anything in the constructor, but we do the assignment. There we go. Nope. Uh, no, I don't want to check it in yet. Wrong console. Okay. Just a sanity, just a quick sanity check. I really should have done it for all four. But I'm just going to do it for one and just skip ahead. Okay. So we covered those two constructors. We don't really need to test the destructor because it's going to have no observable side effects. Okay, we didn't do the type cast operator. We could probably just bundle it in. Eh. Separate tests. Separate tests are always better than bundling it into another test. So this is type cast to string. So it's r really pretty short because all we need to do, oh, hold on. I want to put it in the test string so I can compare it. It's just assert that the test string equals the uh, string file because it should be convertible. Oh, I mashed the assert equal, didn't I? There we go. That's a short of, it's like the shortest test we have for this class. And the vector is the same kind of thing, only it's test vector. Type cast two vector. Huh. No comparison operator for a string, really? I didn't expect that. Oh, is it because it does not, it's not trying to type cast it? Yeah, so let's type, let's do an explicit typecast. And here again, uh, what's the, uh, we'll just copy it as it is. I would have thought it would have tried that itself, but I guess it's not smart enough to try that. Okay, we're good. Just sanity check again. To fail, right? Okay. Okay, we cover everything now. I can actually finish up string file. Assignment. Oh, we didn't do remove. That's the last one, right? Okay, remove. 
I don't have a documentation for removed removes, which is bad. I'm actually not sure what that means. Remove bytes from what? Let's look at the code and try to figure it out. Self-documenting code, right? Okay. Remove. It's going to erase from the beginning to the beginning plus the number of bytes. So it removes from the front. So why didn't I name it remove from front? And then it makes, it clamps the, what is it doing, max? I don't understand this. Because the position is greater than the number of, oh, number of bytes. Question, in Ohio, I, I built RS. Do you know of a way to assign every index of an array with zero if it's not explicitly given a value? It depends on the type of the array. If it's C++, yeah, there's a there's usually depending on which cla like which standard type you mean by array like vector or list, there's usually a constructor. If it's you're talking about a C array, no. So there if it's always if you're just zero, you can you can use memset. If um if it's not zero like you want to set everything to 10 or something, then I would just do a loop. In in a normal C array, there's the tool the 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 facilities are pretty sparse, right? You probably have to do it yourself. But yeah, in C plus plus, usually there's a constructor that will accept an initializer. So I hope that answers your question. If if you want me to talk about a specific kind of array, then you um, please tell me what what type you mean. Let's see. Oh, and you said um, you had another problem, right? That you wanted to ask. Was that was that it, or did you have more code to look at? Yeah. So, really quickly, in VS Code. So if it's something like um, int, right? foo and you had like a hundred so in the code if it's zero you can probably get away with doing this uh foo with zero right uh let me let me check the manual one of those things i always forget okay yeah it is it is a count so it would be zero and then the count Oops, I don't want to save. That's what I would do because it's really fast. But let's say you want to initialize it to something else. Oh yeah, so if, if you just want to fill the rest of it with zero, I would just do a mem set. Because it, that works both for integers and floating point numbers. Let's say it, it wasn't zero or maybe the... Con more complex. You'd have to do something like this. I would do it kind of like this size of foo divided by size of an element of foo just to auto compute the, the length. And then uh, foo i equals whatever. Right? How would you mem set with a 2D character array though? It it actually doesn't care. C is so low level, it doesn't care if that's a 1D or 2D. You just have to make sure that this, like, so if you had, like, 5 here or something, what I would do is use the same size of. That should work. The compiler will auto-compute that the size of that is the size of int times 100 times 5. And memset just takes a number of bytes, I think. So that should clear the entire array, even though it's two-dimensional. And it's safe, too, because the com compiler is auto-computing the size. So if you change that to a 15, it'll still work, and it won't go over. Let me double-check. Memset. It says characters, but I believe in C, a character is always a byte. They even say byte down here. 
So yes. Yeah, they say they say number of bytes. I kind of don't like it how they sometimes they say characters and sometimes they say bytes. And if you're wondering, I always do that if a function has a return value and we're explicitly ignoring it. But a lot of people will just say that. But yeah. Uh, back to Visual Studio. Okay, I was looking at remove, right? I was trying to understand what that was doing. It's taking the maximum of the number of bytes we're removing and the file pointer. So let's say the file pointer was beyond the number of bytes. It's going to take the file pointer position, move it back left, the number of bytes. Well, let's say the file pointer is before the number of bytes we're removing. Well, then it will... Oh, okay, it's clamping to... It, it'll be no less than zero. So it's moving the file pointer back and always removing from the front of the file. So really the the function should be called remove from front. Okay, um I'll wait till you write the whole whole thing. It output multiple zeros? Hmm. If if we're still talking about the code you had before, it was uh, strings, right? So you got to make sure that the you you left room for the null terminators. Or yeah, I guess if you're initializing all with zeros, then that shouldn't be a problem. Let's see, I'm not going to change the name of this function yet because it'll probably break everything that uses it. But I will write doc a document that's missing. This method r removes the given number of bytes from the front of the string and moves the file pointer back at most uh, to either the front of the file or back the same number of bytes removed, whichever is greater or less or closer all right so let's see data element 015 minus 25 was data mem a string i was trying to remember it was a string right Oh, are you are you initializing with the character zero? Or the or literally zero? Like if I still have that code, right? Are you doing basically that? Or are you doing that? Because they're different, right? Okay, you wanted the character zero. So yeah, well, if you initialized everything to have the character zero, then where's the end of your string? You're at the end. At some point, you have to put an end of string, right? Do you want the, it to end after the first zero, or after? I guess you want it to be after the first zero, right? So what I would do is zero initialize it, and then something like like you had a two dimensional array, all right? So you can't use the size of trick, but you can. You can do this, I think. Is that right? That'll give you the number of elements in the first dimension. I think so. And then you would say foo i zero is zero. Try it something like that. So that'll. That puts the null character everywhere, and then this will replace the first character with the with the zero in ASCII. Something like that might might do what you're looking for. So, you got that? I can I can post that in chat so you don't lose it.
Yeah, give it a shot. Okay, this method removes the given number of bytes from the front of the string and removes the file pointer back to either the front of the file or the back or back the same number of bytes removed, whichever's closer. That's probably good enough to if I read that back later I wouldn't I wouldn't be so confused. The question is what if I try to remove more characters than are in the file? What bytes really? The number of bytes to remove from the front of the file. I wonder why I even have this method. It's sort of a weird one. Let's make some tests for it. Remove. So we'll we'll test removing zero and a few and a lot. Actually, we should test removing exactly the number of characters that are in the file, and then we should test removing more than those in the file. That's what we should do. So, if that's our test string, we will try removing zero characters, right? So, in fact, let's set our position to be five. When we remove zero, we assert that the size is still what we expect, which would be test string dot length. And the file pointer should not have moved, right? Then we're gonna we're gonna remove more than one, more than let's remove a few so that we would expect. Here's where I'm going to say we should have removed two. The position should be three now, and the string should be almost the same. Only we remove the first two characters. Now we'll remove. Let's say more than the file position, but less than less than what's in the file. So that would be like something like five. So it should remove five more. Position won't go to negative. It should go to zero, and we'll remove five more. It should just be world, right? Now we will try removing more than what's left in the file. Five, six, seven, eight. So we'll try to remove ten. So we should be down to zero. It's completely empty. Yeah, an empty string. That's what we expect, I think. Hopefully it'll work. If it doesn't work, that means we have a bug. Oh, we have a bug somewhere. Let us debug that and see the bug. Erase out of range. Okay. It happened. Okay, it, when we tried to remove more than what's in the file, I guess we don't have a check. Yeah, we don't have a check. Is that a bug? I mean, you could, we could say in our header file here that this should be no more than the the number of characters in the file, but it's easy enough to just consider it a bug and clamp it, right? So we'll clamp it minimum of the number of bytes and the value dot size uh, dot length, right? We have we been calling it size? Yeah, size. We put a clamp like that, and by the way, standard min, we should always include algorithm. Okay, we already are. Okay, so that fixed the bug. Let's check that in. First, the test. Oh, we have a bunch of tests. We'll just check, check all the tests in. Uh, test the remainder, really, of the public methods of string file. Okay, and this chain, first this one, we're add missing documentation, document string file remove. Oh, while I'm at it, I should see if there are any more to do's in the header file, especially. No, oh, and I should update the copyright. While I'm at it, I really should use the neato copyright symbol there. It's a problem with Visual Studio though. If if I don't have any non-ASCII characters and I try to do that, it doesn't always save it with the correct encoding. I want it to be UTF-8 encoding. So I'm going to check it by opening in VS Code. Okay, actually it worked. Oh, that's nice. Sometimes it saves it as uh, not UTF-8, but like uh, one of those uh, Windows code pages that allows the symbol, but not encoded in UTF-8. 
Oh, I'm not looking at the right file. String file dot h, right? Okay, now it's good. And there is also string file dot cvb. Let's fix that too while we're at it. Okay, and yeah. We also covered string extensions. Let me fix that up. Okay. Okay, but there were no more things that were undocumented in string file dicep, right? No more in there. There's a comment for everything, I hope. Okay. Oh, it doesn't completely obscure the inner state. Let's do that as a refactoring step. So let's finish our check-in first. We document and remove. This is a bug we fixed. Our, okay, question. Are two dimensional arrays just laid out in memory like one dimensional array? If it's C, then yes. Something like what we were looking at, right? This is really just syntactic sugar for something like this. It's really gonna look like that. The difference is the compiler treats, it lets you do two things, right? Ha, have something like that. And also this is really indexing every five bytes or every five integers rather than every integer. But otherwise it's the same. I mean, you can have as many dimensions as you want. You're just ending up multiplying it. In C++, it's different though. Like if you had a, a vector of vectors of int, even if you did something like that, well, for one thing, you would have to do something like this. I think I don't. I might have the order of arguments backwards, but the construction is different in order to get the dimensions preallocated, and also it's no not in any way like that. You actually have a hundred objects, each containing five other objects, right? So it's a lot different. You, yeah, you're right. You could have something intermediate. You could do something like this. I would call that sort of a bastardization of C and C++. It's a combination of both. You, that, now you'll have to figure out what it points to. I don't think you can do something like this, though. But I could be wrong. I don't think so, because... You really only can only do that when you're declaring storage, and this is declaring a type, not storage. So you'd have to do something like that, or like like that, and now you're going to have to find storage for each of those inner arrays, and yeah, it would just be a mess. So yeah, we're actually you know really talking about two different languages, so they're they're handled quite differently. Let's see, position in, f yeah, okay. I was back on here. I think this change was just the bug fix and that was it. Fix bug in remove. Uh, don't try to remove beyond the end of the string buffer. Because if you do, it'll crash. And this one is just up update copyrights. I actually read somewhere that doing something like putting in the copyright is really not needed anymore because everything is copyright by default according to some international treaty. But I don't know. Keep it there because I'm used to. So I think I've covered every method. And I can just do the refactoring. I kind of want to apply the ref the the what I call the no, not just what I call, but what's called the pointer to implementation or pimple pattern. And that looks like this. You define an opaque structure, and then you basically put all of your 
private member variables inside that opaque structure so that anyone including our API header doesn't actually know we're using DQ, right? And we will move that to the implementation. And you put it around here, string file impl, and then you actually give it, you put it here, and you say something like, what I say in UTF-8? It contains the private properties, right? Contains the private properties of the st of a string file instance. Now we have to do a little bit of fix up. We're using unique pointer to, for unique pointer. We need memory, but the good thing is we don't have to expose that we implemented in terms of DQ anymore. That moves to the implementation. I'm actually wondering why are we including standard lib? That might be by accident. Yeah, we don't need standard lib. I don't even think we need standard int. Oh yeah, we do. Standard int, and we need vector, and we need string. Okay. Oh, and at the same time, I'm going to do another pattern called the rule of zero, or rule of five, where if you declare any of these five special methods, you declare them all, even if you default them. And I call it lifecycle management, and this is how I do it. They're deleted by default. We don't um, don't bother to document the rule the the five specials because they're all they should be well known to anyone who's looked looked up rule of zero. And that should be it. We just need to get the implementation to work because we have screwed it up. So instead of position, it's we can actually do that, that's more modern C++, and we don't have to initialize position at all. Instead, we have impl, new impl. And another thing I'm going to do is, I used to have underscore in front for private variables. I don't do that anymore because it turns out like if you had something like that, technically that's not allowed by the C++ standard. Anything with an unders underscore and a capital letter is supposed to be reserved for the compiler or reserved for the li standard library or something like that. And also, it's not a private method uh, or var variable of this class anymore at all anyway. So I can just remove the underscore. For something that really is a private, like the, like the impl itself, I'll put it as a trailer because that does not run afoul of any kind of reserve names. Oh, right, but in front of all these imp values, oh, I can do that in one sweep too. In front of all of them, except for in that place, we're going to want to put impl and then arrow. We just need to remove it from this one place here. Okay, all the constructors have to have the same kind of thing. And I'll just turn that from an initializer to be um, a sign. Oh, we need to do the same thing for position. Impl position. Alrighty. I think that's that's it. Interesting. Okay, so I have some code that relies on what is that? It relies on the copy constructor. Interesting. Okay, so when we're going to need to implement the copy constructor. What depends on copy constructor? Oh, clone does. Yeah, clone does. Well, since it's internal, we can, instead of using the copy constructor, we can just be a little bit more explicit. We can just copy each element, or really we can we can dereference copy like this. That's probably better. 
Now if we add anything to our implementation, it just gets picked up by the default copy operator for a struct. All right, so that's pure refactoring. So we don't we don't have any changes to our unit test, and they should still pass. Yep, pure refactoring. I always just make the subject refactoring so that when I look at the change log later, I can I can tell which changes actually changed real code, like add a feature, fix a feature, versus just ref refactoring is just cleaning up, essentially. How did we refactor? Numerous things. Move, or it really, uh, yeah, well, we can say move. Move private members of string file into opaque ample struct. So that allowed us to remove API dependency of string file on DQ. So string file doesn't depend on DQ at the API level anymore. It does depend on it in the implementation still though, of course. Right. So change private property naming convention convention from leading underscore to no underscore, but inside impl. I think that was it. All, all these look... Oh, cause so clone. Clone is different. Uh, make clone copy impl structure rather than rely on a copy constructor, which we're deleting by default. It should be good. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about string file. Okay, I'm just looking at the time. I'm supposed to end by seven, so that's 17 minutes from now. So I should probably start wrapping up the stream. I apologize if you're coming in late, but I uh, really needed this stream to be no more than two hours long. I will start wrapping up. I'll talk about what I've done before and what I'm going to be doing next time in, in case that sounds interesting and try to give you an idea of my schedule. So what we did this time, I'll, since it, it was like a two parter, I'll go back to stream 11. So we did this earlier at the beginning of my stream today. No, here. Oh, I forgot to, I totally forgot to set up a page for, this stream. Shoot. Okay, I'll, I'll fix that. So anyway, what I started on today, I was working on a class called UTF-8, which is handling Unicode, which is international character set encodings. Yesterday, I mostly wrote it. Today, I was finishing it up. We, did, we wrote code to detect invalid encodings, several different rules we had to make sure were followed. And then we started bringing in this old library I started a couple years ago that I need need to freshen up. So we're, I updated its directory structure, started setting up unit tests for parts of it. It didn't have any tests at all, so I was treating it like what we call legacy code. And there are some suggestions of streamers to, to check out. So these guys, Nibblesio and Cyanox, also do similar streams to what I do, only they're, they've been doing it longer, so I'm, I'm going to be uh, watching them to get some tips. And uh, the second part of the stream after my break, I showed off this tool, mostly because it was mentioned that I think uh, Nibblesio is making a language or new language compiler in C++. And I had written a tool that defines its own language. And I was showing how I do that sort of thing in, uh, in C++ by using Bison and Flex, which are really old tools for creating compilers. And oh, I still need to do this. 
mentioned like two or three streams ago the strategy pattern, but I don't have that in my my list. So yeah, we finished up the UTF-8 stream nicely and brought in the new library without too much work. I took a break and I came back and did string file. So we have both string extensions and string file done. And if I look at the list in VS Code, sorry, in VS Code, we've done string extensions and string file. There's a couple ones that are gonna be really hard to test, so I might not do them right away. I might postpone that for, I don't know, weeks or months. But I'll, I'll be looking through, in the short term, my plan is to look through to see if there are any of these other classes that I can make uh, unit tests for. We've already found some bugs, so unit tests are good to have. Once I have good enough coverage of that, we're gonna be moving on. So next on my plans would be medium term. We're actually going to have all the elements we need to start making a live web server. Let me zoom that in a bit. I think it's going to start getting interesting because what I plan to do, I have a hosting service they pay for. and It's basically a Linux server in a, in a cloud. And I can set up a live web server for my viewers to try to play with and break and test that are going to be using these elemental classes and using them to respond to a web requests. So we'll be able to talk to it through a web browser. Once that's working and reasonably stable, I want to give it the capability to have plugins for supporting dynamic content. So code that's responding to web requests, not just static documents. And then I want to add web sockets and demonstrate that using a simple chat room implementation. Web sockets let you do bi-directional communication between a web server and client, which is really cool. And then after that, on the long-term roadmap, we need to support secure connections. So I need to support transport layer security and cryptography. I'm not gonna do that from scratch. I'm going to pull in some fairly well-known open source components to do that, that I've been researching. And then I have two things I wanna do with my web server stuff. Uh, first was, I listed last year, I wanna, for, I have a blog that's based on WordPress, I want to ditch that and replace it with my own web server, just cause. And then I want to make a Twitch bot now that I know that Twitch's APIs are all web-based. After that, I'm not sure what we'll do. Maybe some game dev, maybe explore some uses of, of the web. Actually, what I'd really like to do is play around with uh, web dev, like React or Angular or Vue, and maybe use the the web server that we're deploying as like a, a test bed for making uh, web client apps. Right. So, just looking to see if I miss anything. How are we on checking stuff in? Okay, I just need to push it upstream. Okay, I mentioned this earlier in the stream because I get asked a fair amount. I should probably put it in the frequently asked questions. I don't have my code publicly available yet, but I probably will soon. I just need to set up a license file I'm comfortable with and double check I don't have any personal info in, the, in, in these repositories. And then I'll, I'll push it upstream for you guys if you're interested in uh, checking it out and running it and playing with it. Oh, I had a, that's right, I had syntax error and that's the license I was looking at. I was just gonna make a like an MIT license that you've probably seen a lot. But I wanted to double check that I'm doing the right thing. So this is fix a typo. Simple enough. So yeah, you'll be able to clone this code and run it yourself soon. Anyway, I'm gonna be wrapping up the stream and let me show you that list again. They're probably not online yet, but uh, Nibblezio and Cyanox are two guys that recommended to me earlier today to follow. And as far as my schedule, I work full time. So during the week, if I stream, it'll be late night Pacific time. So like 9 p.m. to midnight or 8, 10 p.m. to midnight. So the weekend is a bit different since I don't have to work. It's more during the day. 
So if I'm if I'm streaming next, it'll be tomorrow night at uh, eight to nine p.m. Pacific. So if you found this interesting, I hope to see you soon. And as always, thank you for watching. And your feedback's really important. I, I've learned a lot just streaming in the past 12, 13 streams. And I hope I'm helping you guys out too. Or at least being somewhat entertaining and showing you what coding is like. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Bye.